Ladies and gentlemen, we now have the second panel discussion. Augmented humans. Are superhumans the new reality? So maybe we don't need to go into outer space anymore. We can make our own aliens here on Earth. Please welcome to stage our panelists and the moderator for this session, Dr. Hawa El Mansouri. Well, first of all, let me welcome everyone to this wonderful conference and to the next big thing. Um, the subject of this panel is human augmentation. Now, when one reads the subjects being discussed today, and your eyes kind of glance over and see the title Human Augmentation, um, some of us may even imagine, not only a few years ago, an event such as a Star Trek convention or a sci-fi movie opening. Uh, one might have not imagined that a few years later, um, it's a real topic and something we have to face as a potential reality. So human augmentation is actually happening. Uh, I don't know how many people are interested in this field or myself being a physician, I'm aware of a few um, specialties where human augmentation is already happening. For example, artificial limbs is one of them. This is a reality. There are limbs where you can even have sensation after uh, attachment uh, to where your original limb used to be. Uh, we don't have to look far. Uh, the neurosurgical subspecialties, uh, you have exoskeletons which you attach to human beings who have had spinal damage to be able to do physical therapy and therefore improve. Um, this is all now a reality. If we take it a step further, uh, you can start having interesting discussions about, well, you can fix a problem, but what about making a superhuman? And then you enter into the ethical discussions of should we? And this is where um, we go into the panel discussion. I have the great honor of welcoming our panelists today. Uh, give me the opportunity to introduce them. First, um, uh, to my left, we have Dr. Uh, Al-Hilal Al-Naqbi, mm -hmm. who is a research fellow at Harvard Medical School and professor at UAE University. Dr. Al-Naqbi is the UAE inventor of the first bio-artificial liver he was awarded as one of the UAE pioneers in 2014. Then we have um, Dr. Jennifer Miller, Assistant Professor of Medical Ethics and Population Health at NYU School of Medicine. She is the founder and president of the New York-based nonprofit Bioethics International, an organization focused on addressing the ethics, transparency, and governance of healthcare innovation. Subsequently, we have Sue Peshin, President and CEO at the Alliance for Aging Research. She has co-organized the first ever summit on geroscience, produced an award-winning film on geroscience and extension of health span. Finally, and not least, we have Zoltan Istvan, journalist and author of the novel Transhumanist Wager, former candidate in the USA presidential elections of 2016, currently running for governor of California, He's a libertarian transhumanist who, incidentally, has a microchip already implanted in his hand, and we will be discussing that. <laughs> so please, everyone, help me welcome them. So to kick off this fascinating subject, let's start with the word superhuman. Sometimes this is used by lay people, uh, but lately there's a new technical term transhumanism. Now, what does that mean? Zoltan, I think you are best to answer this. <laughs> sure, well, you know, a word can define a movement, and the world right now is searching for a word to encompass all the radical science and technology that is changing our worlds. And, you know, there are many different types of words, futurist, uh, singularity, biohacking, but transhumanism, which actually in Latin means beyond human, has been the word that has been winning this kind of term that puts an umbrella over all the radical science and technology that is hitting the human race and changing our world. Now, when you think of transhumanism, you have to understand that beyond the word, it's a social movement. And I used to say just a few years ago that the social movement was made up of a few million people around the world that wanted to use radical science and technology to change the human body and to change essentially the human experience. 
But now the movement has grown so fast, especially with youth and millennials, that I now say it's a social movement of tens of millions of people. To understand transhumanism, you have to kind of compare it to something like environmentalism. 25 years ago, very few people thought that cutting down trees or uh, harming the earth was something that was wrong or something that was kind of, you know, not to be done. And then all of a sudden, this movement of becoming green, of becoming environmentally friendly took over. And now you would say that at least three or four billion environmentalists across the world, at least half the planet. Well, transhumanism, the social movement, is on a very similar trajectory. You're going to see in the next 10 to 15 years, this social movement become very important where people start embracing radical technologies in their life, like driverless cars, chip implants that make their lives more functional, um, bionic hearts so you can avoid heart disease, whatever it is, radical technology and science in your life to make it more functional. That's what transhumanism is. Thanks. Um, you mentioned an interesting word, a social movement. Um, uh, this brings me to Sue for a question. Uh, what do you think of that? Is it a social movement? Uh, I am not, I, I think it probably is. I think that there are people who are uh, definitely into extreme life extension um, through technology. Uh, I, I would say that um, in terms of where we are right now though, we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I definitely think that there are people who subscribe to it. Um, I think that there's a difference, though, between extending lifespan versus extending health span. And that's a way of sort of considering if we're going to be adding years to our lives, are those years going to be healthy or not? And so all of these technologies need to take health into consideration and what the impact is going to be on humans. Mm -hmm. Um, and what the impact is going to be also on our personalities and our, on our ways of being human that are unique to us as humans. So I think that those are all very, very important. Okay, well this question's for you. What is the meaning of aging at a time when a super extended lifespan could be within reach? Yeah, so that, I, I think that, that sort of is, you know, a comment on, on the mm -hmm. earlier question. Um, I was taking a look at uh, the UAE and, and in terms of what the average lifespan has been and, and how, it's, how far it's come, even in a short period of time. Um, back in 1960, the average lifespan in the UAE was 53, and today it's closer to 78. So it's grown leaps and bounds just in a short period of time, and, and it's likely to keep going up, but I would subscribe that there will be an eventual limit to it. Zoltan probably does not subscribe to that, and, and that's okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, again, modern medicine has added all these years to our lives, but they haven't necessarily been healthy ones. And now we're looking at a lot of non-communicable diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's disease and heart disease as a result to, of the extension of our lifespan. Um, there's an area of science that has been emerging now for a number of years called geroscience, which takes a look at really the underlying biology of aging itself. And companies like Google have invested in uh, entities like Calico to take a look at, at this type of research, as has the National Institutes of Health and other centers around the world. And it's, it's instead of sort of looking at things disease by disease, heart disease versus cancer versus Alzheimer's, it's looking at the underlying causes of all those diseases together. So it's a, a way to sort of create efficiency in science and a way to not just increase the number of years we live, but the number of years that we're able to live healthy and fulfilled. Right. So what you're saying, just as a translation, as a physician, is that the older you get, the more problems might arise and that we'd have to, have to face. That's right. Okay, very good. Uh, this brings me to um, my next question, uh, which is in relation or very pertinent to our youth as well. Um, as we augment humans and presumably if I may make that presumption, extend life, or healthy life, yes. uh, we face this future of super old mutants, as you might say, or super old human beings that have been augmented. Um, uh, is this a future that we're facing at this point? Uh, I, I pose the question first to Dr. Al-Nakbi. Thank you, Dr. Howard. I think um, 
the technology it is, it's um, advancing and um, uh, the question maybe we uh, we raise right now we we discussing uh, super humanities or super mind is who is the normal mind um, are we normal now uh, compared to 20 years back and are we a super mind compared to the people who are coming in a few years from now um, actually I'm working on an artificial device um, a bio artificial device which a few years back was an impossible to create and to come up with um, we are talking now that if this artificial device can be implemented people are coming now uh, to consider and to think uh, seriously uh, do we need these kind of artificial devices to cure di diseases mm -hmm. or just we want them uh, for the benefit to become uh, superman, uh, increase or enhance our capabilities. Um, um, people, um, I think, um, when we conducted a survey, uh, we discussed it in our um, um, council, the Human Enhancement Council, 10% of the total population, they know about human enhancement. And the rest, they don't know but they still want to be enhanced their capabilities by having artificial limb, prosthetics or orthotics. So I think the technology is advancing, but who will benefit from it? And um, the youth here is um, kind of um, uh, lucky and fortunate that they know that the technology is there. And as we have seen this morning, uh, the survey that is being conducted on behalf of um, uh, on behalf of the councils that um, eight, uh, sorry, 44 percent they believe that education and technology are aligned and mapped together. So this is a very lucky and fortunate to know that our youth understand and believe. So um, the human enhancement is uh, something is coming, and we thought it is in the future, but I think it is now. And we Absolutely. believe that how we are going to use it, is it uh, going to use it for uh, curing diseases or are we going to use it just for uh, increase our capabilities of doing things? And I think this is something the panel wanted to impart on our youth um, in this conference, that this is now. We're not talking 50 years, we're not talking 100 years. This is not a futuristic movie. This is happening right now. There's research in nanotechnology in the field of healthcare. Um, I mean, we haven't gotten to the part where like, we're like in the matrix when you download all this knowledge into your system. But frankly, it doesn't sound like we're that far. But this is a serious reality we have to face. And the future generations are the ones that are going to be facing it and more importantly, making the decisions. Which brings us into the ethics of it. Dr. Jen Jennifer, uh, this is where I ask uh, for your input on this. Um, two things. Uh, what do you foresee the social implications of augmentation? I know that's a, that's a kind of wide question, but um, I do try to summarize it. There's a lot of interesting aspects to it, and also touch upon kind of the ethical things we have to confront, or the ethical questions we have to confront. Um, so I'll take the first part of the question uh, first. So, you know, if we're gonna be living hundreds and thousands of years longer, um, there's some very practical consequences to that. The first one being that it would be a very crowded planet, perhaps overcrowded, um, and a correlation, a related issue would be a sh could be a shortage of resources. Um, not enough food, not enough shelter, not enough jobs, things that we already know can be uh, scarce. This immediately raises questions of who should get what when, where, and why. These are somewhat rationing questions. We deal with them now, but they will be much more acute in the future if this is the type of future that evolves. Um, Francis Fukuyama believes that the rich are the ones who will have first access to enhancements, and therefore they will be stronger and better able to compete for the scarce resources, creating a cycle where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. These are some theories. Um, there could be a question about what's the point of having children if the world is already populated by you know, people who are a thousand years. Will we care about creating future generations? Um, maybe we'll have to stop having children or at least limit them if there's not enough space. Uh, if that were to happen, I, 
I fear two, two consequences. One, a stagnation of ideas. A lot of our ideas come from the youth, the new ideas. And a lot of our hope comes from the youth. We place a lot of hope in the youth, and the youth are hopeful, sometimes naively hopeful, but nonetheless hopeful. Um, and so those are just a few quick um, ethical consequences or considerations. I will say some of them are solvable. If we were to run out of space, and we're so technologically advanced, we could colonize another planet. Um, if there isn't enough food, we could use cellular technologies to grow different types of meats um, and vegetables, which is already happening. Uh, so I don't want to be too pessimistic about it. But those are the first comments. Wonderful. Uh, it, it, it is up to our youth to also think of the solutions uh, and actually face the problems. I mean, going into something in, in excitement is wonderful but being blind uh, to the problems that you might face uh, can lead to failure. So knowing the problems we have to face is actually a good thing. It's not being pessimistic, it's, it's being realistic and being willing to fix them. Um, we kind of touched upon the, the ethics of, you kind of already did, uh, you know, who, who gets these parts? Uh, yeah. Is it uh, the rich? Is it uh, yeah. the, in the industry? Is it the in the know? Um, is it in only a certain segment? Is it for only certain specialties? And I mean. Um, so currently, so th there's two ways to access a technology. One, while it's under development, so in a clinical trial, and then two, if it's been approved by some regulatory body and is more widespread on the market. Uh, in both cases, I'm going to venture to say that it's going to be the young, healthy, wealthy white male that has first access uh, to the technology. Why do I say that? Uh, if you look at basic biotechnology drug development and medical device development, uh, we tend to test drugs on healthy young white males. Uh, there was a study that looked at drugs approved by the FDA from 2011 to 2013, and almost 80% of the participants were white. Only 7% were of some other um, ethnicity. If you're building an enhancement based on genomic data, 80% of the genomic data is Caucasian. Only 3.5% comes from black Hispanics, 14% from Asians. Uh, once That's pre-market. Once the products are available on the market, I'm very concerned about their prices. For example, one of the first gene therapies is likely to be approved by the FDA um, any, any day now or any month now. Uh, it'll be a treatment for blindness. It's a huge breakthrough, but they've projected the gene therapy to cost a million dollars. Um, and so the question will be, who will have access to such expensive drugs? Now again, with every innovation, we can come up with a social innovation to, an, to help us access these things. So we're trying to come up with creative payment solutions, like maybe we start to pay for drugs like we pay for houses with mortgages, monthly payments, monthly payments that we only make as long as the drug is working. Um, so, so that type of thing. So in conclusion, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the young, healthy, white, wealthy male that gets first access. Fair enough. It's, it's good to know the numbers and be realistic. Uh, we actually have someone who's, I could argue, augmented. Zoltan, can you tell us a little bit about your chip? Sure. I have a, a small microchip essentially in my hand right here that does a number of things. It can open doors, uh, it can start a car, it can send you a text message if you come close enough to me and have the right um, uh, software on your phone. And um, in my case, I usually open it, use it to open my front door. Essentially, it replaces keys. Um, it's not really trackable. I mean, you can track it from a little distance, a few feet away, but I believe only the military has the ability to track this type of technology. Um, but it can also be used at some point in the future. You'll be able to pay with it. Um, some places now allow you to pay with it, but Visa, NASCAR, some of those major companies have not signed on in, to using this type of technology. But there will be a day coming very soon in the future where you will swipe your hand at a coffee shop and you will just not have to have a wallet. Your money will go right through your chip. And, um, and it's a very convenient future. A chip replaces about 20 to 30 percent of the functionality of your smartphone and yet it only costs between 50 and $70, and you can put it in through a syringe. Um, the problem is that can also go obsolete, and then you have to replace it, and that requires a small surgery. And then there's also cybersecurity concerns. But um, it's a very brand new field. Uh, two years ago, there was 10,000 people with the implant. Last year, there was 20,000. This year, there are 40,000. And it seems like the trajectory of the amount of people getting it are going to be um, exploding. And so we'll probably have a few million people with it within four or five years, we think.
That's, that's very optimistic. Wow, okay. Uh, how, many, how many of those people are, are afraid or terrified of their uh, private information being accessed or someone tracking them? <laughs> you know, it, it's really, there's a lot of different fears about it, but it's not really able to do anything more than you could do by stealing somebody's cell phone. And except the cell phone, you have the, you know, Facebook, for example, if you have it, most people can just go right on and they've already had their passwords programmed in. So in the chip, it's actually quite difficult because you would have to be a sophisticated hacker in order to find out that information. So it's actually a bit safer than a lot of people realize, but it's not as effective yet as I think I would want it, where you can do all sorts of things. For example, it can't monitor my... You know, it can't monitor my heart rate yet, which is very important. One thing I have advocated for is a, a trauma alert chip. So if anybody was being attacked or if anybody was being, um, you know, drowning or if anybody was in a terrible car accident, something would measure your, you know, the blood, the volume, heart rates, things like that, you just even arteries, and be able to s send off an emergency signal to people to come save you. And for those of us, you know, who have children, this could be a very useful kind of way to feel more secure about, you know, our children's and their safety. So, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a big future there. The question is, are we willing to accept it? Uh, does it work within the cultural parameters? And also, you know, it's a bit eerie and transhuman, but, you know, a lot of things have been eerie and scary to us, uh, you know, humans, and um, we've kind of gotten over that and moved forward. I think everyone in this room probably has a cell phone and probably 15 years ago, Nobody would have thought they would all have a cell phone. Well, we all have one, and that's sort of how the future is unfolded. Absolutely. We didn't think we'd have iPhones that can, you know, pinpoint our location to, what is it, 50, 10 meters? Kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think a lot of technologies are, you know, what you make them. Uh, it's what you do with them, how you misuse them, uh, and the rules and regulations you can put in to keep that from happening. Um, uh, the, next question, the next question is really a very tough one to answer. Is it right? Is it right to take a human being and modify them or augment them? Uh, I know a lot of people, especially in our society, argue this. Anything from organ transplant to um, any sorts of modification of the human body. Um, I, I pose this to Dr. al Nahbi, being um, uh, also in addition to that part of the society, uh, and I'm sure faced with this question repeatedly, uh, what is your, your take on this matter? Is it right to augment human beings? I think um, technology has uh, different sizes. It's like a coin has bad things and, and, and good things. And the people around us, and again, I refer to the uh, survey that we conducted and the survey that we have seen, 10% um, 10, 10 of the total population, they believe in technology. And the, and, and, uh, and the meaning that can do something good for the humanity. Um, without legislations, without, um, while we are talking now, I have been to um, a session, they were talking about uh, agile, um, or accelerating agile uh, governance. Uh, we have to care about each other, we have, to, uh, we have to have some kind of values, we have to kind of ethics that Sue is talking about, and we have to understand who should, uh, who should be uh, transformed somehow. And to be honest, the question that is raised at the moment is, should we um, uh, transform or should we come up with a human in, or enhance a human before birth or after birth? Do we, do we really need that uh, genome editing? So these kind of a question will raise other legislations with the, the governance and the values. Um, it, is, it is not an easy um, a question to answer, and it is an interdisciplinary kind of an effort between, between almost everyone, technologists, um, um, government, policy makers, um, physicians, yourselves as well because um, it, is, it is an important that uh, what is needed from augmentation? Is it for, again, uh, disease curing or just for enhancing capabilities? Sometimes if you ask um, a, a person, um, do you think if I, not in the kind of augment, but uh, transform your limb into prosthetics that can uh, lift if, uh, a few more kilograms, she or he will say no. But if you reverse the question into, can I enhance your vision to see something that microscope only see it? So yes, I would love to. So it is, it is the way you, you, you give it to them and the way that 
uh, they believe that it's needed to be, to be used for. Um, again, it is, it is an interdisciplinary effort. Just imagine the longevity uh, with the people who will live more than 100 years in the lifespan. Um, they will be left alone. Uh, I mean, it is not that just the human enhancement, but even the environment en enhancement. You have to enhance the environment and the surroundings to accept them and to fulfill and understand kind of their capabilities as well. It is not just augmentation in the meaning of a human enhancement. It is what we need from that, what values are expected, what the capabilities that we are looking for. So actually, um, uh, before this event, uh, Sue had mentioned that uh, much of these technologies are first developed to fix a problem, whether it be um, paralysis, whether it be loss of a limb, whether, whatever it may be. Even gene, gene therapies are designed, uh, like Dr. Nakbi mentioned, uh, either before or after birth, to fix a problem. But then, human beings, as industrious as we are, we start taking it an extra step. What if we make ourselves stronger, faster, cooler? <laughs> and here we go down a slippery slope. Um, I mean, do we want uh, someone like the show Six Million Dollar Man, where you know you can see I don't know 20 kilometers ahead and you're you're running at the speed of light? I don't know. Uh, so this is where you cross into from fixing a problem to modifications, like I don't know, like you you go to the beauty parlor parlor to look more beautiful, do you modify yourself to be stronger or faster? Um, uh, what, what I want to ask Sue um, as a follow-up to that is, okay, so the youth are now, the future generations, are going to be faced with this wonderful reality. It is wonderful, it's stimulating, but it's also problematic, so you also have the responsibility. But what happens to the aging population, and, and, and Dr. Jennifer also touched upon this, we already have in the world problems of youth not having jobs, uh, where to put the elderly, whether or not they're healthy, um, how would they contribute. What, what do you foresee happening uh, with the older generation? Let's say, for example, like Dr. Al-Nakbi said, they live 150 years, 200 years. Mm -hmm. What happens to them? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, and one point that I just want to make sure is not lost on folks is that most people do support regulation of these new technologies that are coming down the pike. So, you know, there is a recognition that there is potential for misuse. There's even potential for harm. Um, but as long as we have parameters, and we, you know, we've said about these things for a number of years, you know, all the technology and medications and treatments that we had to have today you know, didn't exist at one point, and there were worries about them. You know, putting uh, medical devices in our bodies was not something that we did even 50 years ago, uh, 60 years ago, and now it's, you know, commonplace to have limbs, uh, to have joints replaced, to have stents in our hearts, all those things, and we've developed regulations around them for, for limitations, so I think that's, that's important. I actually want to ask everybody in the room something. How many people here had the benefit of knowing at least one of their grandparents? How many people? Raise your hand. Did anybody here ever have the opportunity to know a great grandparent? Anyone? Okay, I was very fortunate. I knew all of my grandparents and I knew uh, two of my great grandmothers. Um, so a point that I want to make to you is older people are not a separate species. Um, we often sp talk to, you know, about them as if, you know, there's the youth and then there's old people, right? And we are aging. We're aging from the moment that we're born. So, you know, I hate to break it to everyone in the room, but we are aging in this moment. We are aging. So it's really not that separate from us, even though, you know, there is a youth ministry. I think it would be wonderful if there were an aging ministry as well. Um, this is a population change that's happening all over the world. Uh, as long, you know, we're having these, these uh, growths uh, with baby boomers and the generation after baby boomers, millennials and post-millennials, and you're all overtaking things and you're all going to be aging. And the generations even after, you know, millennials and post-millennials are bigger than the baby boomers. 
So aging is not going away anytime soon. Now it does have big implications, um, as Jen mentioned, on population shifts. Um, there's big shifts in fertility across the world, folks having children at older ages or not having as many children, uh, which affects you know, the youth population. It definitely impacts the job market. It impacts healthcare, financing of healthcare, financing of long-term care. So all these things are things that we need to keep in our minds as we are developing these new systems and technologies. Um, I think that for you all, as you're looking for what to do, it's important to understand you know, where trends are going, what skills you need to learn, uh, what open areas they're going to be as the population ages and as these new technologies come into the market. And if I can impart anything on you, uh, what we've learned from research in healthy aging, it's to really have purpose and to not lose connection, to not lose connection to each other, to other generations, and, and to have purpose in what you're doing, no matter if you go into uh, becoming a mechanic or a plumber, vocational, working on this new technology, whatever it is you do, do it with purpose and, and with the intent to help others. That's a very important point. Thank you for making that. Uh, Zoltan, being um, the person on this panel uh, who is very interested, if I may say, into politics and into governance <coughs> and potentially going to be part of the people putting down certain guidelines and, and you know, rules and regulations in, in your own home country. Um, can you share with us what you think the greatest barriers might be from your perspective? Well, I, I think, you know, <laughs> contrary to what some other people on this panel may think, I think the largest barrier is government regulation to all this technology being developed. Uh, I, as a libertarian, believe that we should allow these technologies to blossom as they are. We should let capitalism and money push these things forward so that people have the opportunity to um, take them and improve their lives. And um, a lot of people say, wow, this technology is so radical that we need a bunch of regulation, we need a bunch of government involved in it, we need a bunch of, you know, let's stop, let's do moratoriums, I mean, like genetic editing. First thing that happened two years ago, international community said, let's put a moratorium on genetic editing, even though genetic editing, one of the great, perhaps the greatest science that's going to be in the 21st century, has a possibility to end aging and cancer, do a whole host of different things, and yet our first reaction was, let's put a moratorium on it. I don't believe in any of that. I think we just need to let the free market, let transhumanism technology thrive and do its best to get out there so that people can use it. Now, as a politician, what's very important to me in, in a little bit of contrast to that, especially as, as a libertarian, I do believe that we should make sure that nobody gets left behind, that everybody has access to this radical science and radical technology. Um, that is a little bit different than the free market approach I just gave you, but at the same time, it's very important that we don't have the haves and the have-nots, because if we do, we're going to create a dystopian society where the rich take all the best technologies and essentially become a different super being. And let me just close by saying, you know, one of my most important, um, I guess, policies, as I've been doing both as a presidential candidate and now as a gubernatorial candidate in California, is trying to insist that aging should be classified as a disease, because that is something that once it gets into culture, once it gets into the government kind of mindset, all of a sudden we realize that we can tackle aging as we would tackle any other disease. When you think of cancer, you're like, yes, let's overcome it. But when you think of aging, you do not think, oh, let's necessarily overcome it. But aging is problematic. Aging takes away the people we love. Aging is something to be conquered. And that's a policy that I would like to put in place in the United States, which is to classify aging as a disease. Uh, I see Sue would like to respond. <laughs> Go ahead. I thought you might. <laughs> I had to make it spicy. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, I think your hand thing is cool. Um, so I, two, two things I think are important uh, around the issue of free market. 
you know, I, I, I appreciate your sort of optimism that people are creating these technologies with the best of intentions. And I think for the most part that's true. Um, but, you know, there is a reason why we have health and safety regulation. And I don't think that we're, you know, being frantic about it or hysterical about it. I think we're just recognizing that, like all the other technologies that we've had to date, it's important to have some parameters around it. And it's important for the industries that are making uh, these products to think about the potential ramifications and to have some accountability around them. So I think that's, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about regulations and principles and um, and with regard to gene editing in particular I think what you're talking about primarily is germline editing uh, which has implications for future generations if you're changing someone's genetics that will you know actually change if they have uh, offspring uh, the genetics of their offspring as well and that can actually be helpful in cases where you have a family history of a genetic disease that could kill you for example something like Huntington's disease um, and you know the National Academy of Sciences actually just put out a report on this and they actually didn't call for a complete ban on it they just called for caution and that's what we're talking about here now in terms of calling aging a disease I am, not, um, I am not totally opposed to that. I actually think that it is important for us to take a look at aging as, uh, you know, as an area for science. And that's what I'm talking about when I mention geroscience. So, um, I, but I think it's very different than saying it's something we need to tackle and get rid of. Um, and I just was thinking about something when I was looking up transhumanism, because I didn't know that much about it before this experience. Um, and I found uh, in the very first issue of Nature Journal, one of the premier science journals, the very first issue in 1869, they had a piece called Nature, um, Aphorisms by Goethe. And he says in there, Life is her most exquisite invention, and death is her expert contrivance to get plenty of life. And I truly believe that. It's really our knowledge of death that we don't have forever that makes us want to make change in this world and makes our lives purposeful. Dr. Jennifer, briefly, go ahead. Well, I was just going to comment on the regulatory hurdles. They're, they're, they may not be as... Um, high as you think, right? So if you look at biotechnologies and medical devices, an average of 1,900 people, so less than 2,000, take these experiments before they're released onto the market. Um, so it costs a lot of money to, to run clinical trials, but it's not, uh, it's not, it, it, they're not huge regulatory uh, hurdles. I think one of the problems I have with regulation is to pass a medical device in the United States. I know some countries a little bit quicker, eight, nine years, even longer sometimes, from the point of inception of the company, the startup, to the point that FDA actually approves it. And you have to understand that the difference between solving the issue of aging, let's say by 2030, versus the year 2050, is saving one billion lives. So the, again, I'll just repeat that. If you can solve aging by 2030, versus 2050, you will save one billion lives. Now, people can still die, of course, and they can still do whatever they want to do, but there are some people that would like to basically overcome it and remain youthful for however long that they want to live. And I think um, we should create a scientific environment and an economic environment for those ideas to thrive so that we can always be healthy and all our loved ones can also always be healthy. Dr. al Nakbi, would you like to uh, finish off this uh, interesting point? Yeah, I think uh, maybe referring to the survey that uh, I was talking about, 10% uh, when we asked them, do you know anything about so, uh, human enhancement? If we, if, we, if we say Superman, they would know, but we said, or we asked them the question about the trans transforming or human enhancement, only 10% they know about it. So we could not get uh, enough information from them. So what I want to point out uh, of the government effort here, that um, these Global Future Council are at, um, uh, conducting here in UAE and in Dubai particularly. So the youth here have the fortunate to, to know more about a global 
future and um, care and interdisciplinary kind of connection. So um, you have here and you have a full day to go and navigate what is happening because what's happening today is the future that you are going be the main players. So um, you have a very nice and, and you should be um, uh, very proud. It is, it is a fortune that you have to use. So I'm very proud that um, maybe we were discussing that Dr. Sure. Howard uh, yesterday, we did not have maybe such chances in 20 years back, but now this is a very good chance for you to take it over. So um, in, um, in summarizing everything, uh, I suppose there's a bit different views on, on, on different parts of this subject of uh, human enhancement. But I think we can all agree on one thing. This is very exciting, mm -hmm. a very wonderful time in our history. And I agree with Dr. al Nakbi. I think we specifically here in the UAE are extremely lucky. And we want to impart this feeling into our youth that you are very lucky because all you have to do, and I know everyone's very into social media and everything, you're very well aware, look, look around yourself, look into the world. And we are living in an environment where there is encouragement, there is actually positive reinforcement to think outside of the box. You may come up with the craziest, quote unquote, craziest idea, and there'll actually be someone to validate it and say, you know what, that's not so crazy. Go ahead and try. This is a very special environment and a very special mandate, and we are very, very lucky to have it. So I think all the panelists would say, go for it, get involved in whatever field you're in. Like, like it was said earlier with the space panel, you do not have to be a rocket, sci rocket scientist to be interested in space, you don't. So please, take up your part, be involved, and let's face the future together. Thank you very much. Thank you.